Today on Bloomberg Quint, we have with us Senior Counsel, Ms. Indira Jaising. Ms. Jaising, thank you so much for joining us on Bloomberg Quint. Pleasure. Ms. Jaising, I'd like to start by asking you, I said Senior Counsel, and that's something uh, that you've been following for a long time, the Senior Counsel petition, uh, which, which you and I have spoken about extensively. And it's relevant now because the Chief Justice uh, has actually said that there'll be no fresh Senior Counsel designations until the matter is heard. What is what does that update mean? And could you tell us in a nutshell, uh, what's the way forward? Yeah. You must first know the history of why seniors and non-seniors. So it goes back to what is known as King's Council or Queen's Council right. in the UK, where you have two classes of loyal barristers, right. the, the, the designated Queen's Council and the non-designated barrister, and you have the solicitors. Now in India, the, we began in Maharashtra by abolishing the system of solicitors altogether. So although there is a de facto division of labor between those who work on the desk and do the backroom work and those who appear in court, there is no need, in my opinion, for a third layer, which is that of a designated senior. So now how does one get designated a senior? It is the judges of the court in a full court who get together and decide who should be a senior, who should not be a senior, and they vote on it. Now, what you must understand, there's a lot of discontent at the bar that deserving people are not getting designated and non-deserving people get designated. But most importantly, what is the relevance of designation? You'll find that judges tend to take seniors more seriously right. in court. And it degenerates into a system of what we call face law and not case law. So you have a disgruntled bar with a whole lot of very bright juniors who cannot make it to the top of the bar for various reasons, one of them being that they are not designated. And you have a creamy layer at the top, right. a handful of people at the top who kind of monopolize the legal profession. And this also results in skewing of the fees that people charge. Absolutely. The legal services come to become expensive. Right. Now, this is the point at which I decided that, uh, you know, it would be worth trying to challenge right. the system. And so I filed this petition in the Supreme Court. Very simple petition. Which was which, last year. Yeah, last year. Very, very simple. In which I basically said, please tell us the guidelines on the basis of which you designate a person senior. Mm. And I suggested to the court that you should have a 100-point system. And you know, um, tick off on the on your hundred point system how you rate the person, so that we have an objective evaluation of whether a person really deserves to be designated yeah. or not. And these points would consist not just of advocacy, but also what was their written submissions to court mm -hmm. like. What is the quality of their argumentation? Right. Very importantly, have they contributed to public life? Right. Have they done any public interest work? whether in court or outside court. Right. Have they taken up issues which are of relevance to the country? Do they have academic works to their mm -hmm. uh, credit? Do they teach in law colleges? Yeah. Beyond servicing themselves, are they doing anything? These should be the criteria. Now the court did issue notice, but unfortunately for more than a period of one year, nothing mm -hmm. happened. Finally, the matter was argued in October and we were expecting a judgment on the 2nd of January, but the outgoing Chief Justice felt, right. and I feel rightly so, that he had not properly heard all affected stakeholders right. and that they all needed to be heard. He records in his order, which I think is highly creditable, that there is extreme discontent at the bar right. about the manner in which this is. It's the first acknowledgement ever of the fact that something is really wrong uh, in the way the legal system is functioning. So ma'am, you know, those are obviously you're rooting for a more egalitarian system yes. to appoint senior counsels. Um, but also, do you feel that it's been arbitrary all this while, that there's been some sort of abuse of power, there's been a monopoly? Yes, and uh, it might interest you to know that in England, when the system was reformed, there was the Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices report submitted to the government which actually said that the 
harmful effects of this system are that legal services are unaffordable and that the system needs to change. So yes, I have also been toying with the idea of taking this to the Monopolies and Restricted Trade Practices Commission. That would be separate, ma'am, from your petition? Absolutely separate, because that is more about the underlying reasons why you want change. Right. Yeah. Interesting, ma'am. You know, but also it's interesting because you were designated a senior counsel at the Bombay High Court yeah. many years ago. Yeah. Um, do you think the system was as wrong back then as, yeah. as you're arguing it is right now? I think there's been a progressive deterioration. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, I've, I was invited to be designated. But today what you see is a lot of lobbying, and which is why I oppose the system of voting. But on the question that you raised, I was designated by Bombay. Uh, today, there are lawyers who are being designated by different high courts, and then they come to the Supreme Court That's in right. practice. This is partly because the Supreme Court is not designating properly, but it's an abuse of the system as well. So I think there are petitions which challenge that as well, that only the court in which you practice should not designate you. So yes, I would say, um, the tendency to favor kith and kin has grown. Interesting. And one of the things that came up in the Karnataka High Court was that the sitting judges actually designated some of their own relatives and right. it was seriously challenged. I mean, you know, because it's interesting because when I speak to young lawyers out there, uh, especially people uh, who have just graduated from law school and, and, are, and are actually learning how to walk the ropes, for them it doesn't matter that much. You know, this, this seems like an archaic practice. Uh, as does this whole concept of you know being a solicitor, mm -hmm. right? The number of people giving the solicitor's exam is much lesser now. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so do you think doing away with this altogether mm -hmm. would perhaps make it a level playing field? Yes, it's an interesting question because the the, high, the Supreme Court has also transferred from Delhi Delhi High Court to the Supreme Court a petition which challenges the constitutional validity of Section 19, right? Which of actually, the Advocates Act? Yes, which actually sanctions. Uh, two different classes of lawyers. So uh, it is an issue which is not going to go away. Right. And I'll tell you something which uh, disturbs me more than anything else. You must have noticed that the kind of gown which senior counsel wear Absolutely. is different, Absolutely. right? Uh, it has a ridiculous looking flap at the back. In fact, yeah. the whole gown is ridiculous. I don't see why we need to wear gowns. Right. Uh, what bothers me more than anything else is the outward manifestations right. of two classes, mm -hmm. right? So, even if you want a group of seniors, why should the seniors wear a different gown Absolutely. from the juniors? And I would pitch for the, because for me, it's as obnoxious of saying a married woman will wear a tali or some Brahmin will wear a tikka and a senior will wear a different gown. Right. It kind of puts you apart from the, from the others in the profession and that's just not on. It's anti-constitutional. Fair enough, ma'am. So uh, that's, that's that about the senior counsel row. But moving on to something I've always wanted to ask you. You know, ma'am, you've been at the bar for a long time. You've been tracking matters for the longest time. In light of what's been happening over the past few months, right, we've, in fact, by the past few months, for the past couple of years, uh, you know, earlier when we spoke, we, there was this whole hullabaloo about how the right to privacy is not a fundamental right. That's what the Attorney General seemed to say uh, in the Aadhaar case. And, and everyone raised a you and cry about it, especially lawyers saying, this is the first thing you've learned at law school. Um, moving on from that demonetization, you know, the, the way in which it was carried out, uh, obviously there's arguments for and against it, and we're still to see how it pans out. Uh, and all these issues really uh, that have come up, the Aadhaar case as well, that's something you've been tracking as well. But have you noticed uh, some sort of change in the way, uh, you know, is due process of law being followed? Do you feel like judicial independence is still being maintained? You know, I think I would like to start with uh, a comment which one of the judges made like in open court. Justice Lothar, when he referred to the CBI as quote unquote a caged parrot. Now, this happened when the UPA was in power. And at that time, you know, everybody said, well, it's this government, you know, that's manipulating the CBI. If you look at the situation today, how different is it? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, first of all, the appointment of the CBI director itself has been challenged in court on the ground that it didn't comply with due process. What really and truly worries me is the selective use of law by the law enforcement agencies. Okay, It's not every single, so to say, violation of the law which right. is going to be pursued. You are going to be picked up, isolated marked, discriminated against, and then you will be targeted. There is a targeting going on in the enforcement of the law. Now, may I ask, do you think this has been going on for a while now? It's become much worse now? Well, I think we are living under an authoritarian state. And uh, I think this is the hallmark of an authoritarian state, centralization of power in the hands of one person. Uh, we noticed like there could be an actual danger to the collapse of the cabinet system itself or to accountability to parliament. Look at the ordinance Raj. Right now there's been an ordinance on demonetization. Why? Parliament was in session. Why could the bill have not been introduced in parliament? Right. So you notice that there is a kind of hijacking of parliament, you know, into the into the executive domain and people like to use expressions like judicial overreach. I don't believe that there is judicial overreach. I believe there is judicial inaction. So for example, on the issue of demonetization, it was judicial inaction. The hijacking of power has not been from the executive to the judiciary, mm -hmm. but from parliament to the executive. Right. And you know, when the executive acts, it acts in the most deadly way. The Supreme Court cannot act in the same way the executive acts. Because as somebody was saying, uh, the executive have, has the power of the purse and the sword. Right. They have their police force, they have the CBI, and they have the money. The Supreme Court has neither the purse nor the sword. They only have the power of persuasion. So uh, I think when people talk about judicial overreach, they're missing the boat. Right. And the it, it's it's also, you know, to do, in my opinion, it's also to do with the media. It's also to do with the way the media constructs an issue mm -hmm. in the public domain. And you construct an expression like judicial overreach, and then it becomes common tender in, in language. That's about the fourth estate uh, when we're talking about the media. Well, the traditional three organs, the legislature, the executive, and judiciary, what you're kind of saying is that the separation of powers is, is now becoming you know, an old uh, sort of phenomenon, because that seems to be the definition of unconstitutional. Uh, you know, I would say that uh, classical politics and classical law are difficult to separate from each other. Mm -hmm. The underlying basis of all laws is a certain political morality. And so when you are tackling a legal issue, you cannot get away from the underlying morality of the law. Right. After all, the law only has legitimacy um, if it's acceptable to the people. And the same goes for politics. Right. So I do not accept that there is this straitjacket separation right. of powers between the executive and the judiciary. Right. The separation is in the sense that the judiciary is expected to sit in judgment over the actions of the executive. That's the separation. Right. You, As you pointed out, you, when you go to a court of law, when all else fails, right. and at that point you expect the judges to act. So what I'm seeing is not judicial overreach, I'm seeing judicial inaction. And the classical example of that is demonetization. Because if once you admit a petition, once you acknowledge that there is a case for the government to answer, then why don't you take the next step of dealing with the interim orders? Or of at least hearing the petition, but they don't. Thank you so much, Mr. Jaising, for joining us in Bloomer Quinn, and thank you for that candid chat. Thank you so much. Thank you.